Okay, so in the early 80s, Galt McDermott, um, the composer of Hair, teamed up with William Dumas, oh, there he is, uh, to write a musical based on the novel by William Saroyan. It was a musical about Ithaca, California, a place where even the poor give to charity, where thieves are disarmed by kindness, and where ethnic and racial differences are a cause for celebration. There they are, celebrating them. That's all. Uh, yet, yeah, the storybook land is haunted by a disturbing subliminal beat, the persistent tap of the telegraph key carrying war department messages to those Ithaca families whose sons are killed in action. Before Galt McDermott played the show for Joe Papp, uh, Galt McDermott said, I'm not sure if you're going to like this one and want to listen to it. Then Galt McDermott sat down at a piano and he played the score. As Papp listened to the music, he began crying in front of a room full of people. Galt noticed, but he kept on playing. At the end, Pap simply leaned over and said, we're going to do this. In Hair, the first musical to ever play the public theater, Galt McDermott uh, wrote about a hemorrhaging America torn apart by its most unpopular war. Now the same composer had written a musical that was an idyllic fable of a united America fighting World War II. And yet, as Frank Rich noted in his rave review in the Times, in the end, Hair and the Human Comedy subscribed to the same fairy tale idea of democracy. Uh, wars come and go, but justice is their only ideological creed. The work centers around the poor and loving Macaulay family. A widowed mother, three sons, uh, one of whom is enlisted and with a girl at home, and a daughter. The dominant motif of the evening involves the four-year-old son Ulysses and the phantom black trainman who waves to the boy every time his train passes through town. Uh, many critics compared the work to Our Town, uh, and there were plenty of raves. Frank Rich loved the show and gave it political weight. It's a huge thing. Uh, Ethan Morton called it later an exhilarating folk piece, and Ken Mandelbaum said it had a sound unlike any other Broadway opera and was a magnificent work. And yet, uh, the headline in the Post said, The human comedy is insincere goo, and the Daily News called it the ho-hum human comedy. I always think it's a great sign when critics are fighting about a show, because that's great. It means they have strong opinions about it. Um, Joe Papp, he believed in the show throughout all of this. Uh, he said that the show summoned memories of his childhood and young adulthood. He raised the money to transfer the show to the Royal Theater, even though it had no stars uh, and was an incredibly smart, odd show. So in a show without a proven box office star, Joe Papp became, in essence, the star. There he is, the top of the poster was literally Joe, oh, you can't really see, but it's Joe Papp, and he's pointing, and he says, I want you to see it. <laughs> Actually, Joe Papp on the poster. Uh, yes, his picture uh, appeared in newspaper ads, on the program, even on the theater marquee. The television spots featured Papp standing in front of a wall of posters of his past hits. He said, I'm the expert. Check these credentials. Um, some throughout the industry at the time called this an exercise in vanity, but Papp was just ready to pull out all the stops to get an audience to see this show that he so believed in. Um, this is like my favorite thing about producing is that like Joe Papp loved the show and he literally just needed an audience to see it and he was willing to do anything including putting his face all over everywhere. Um, unfortunately, the human comedy closed after only 13 performances on Broadway. As Ken Mandelbaum writes in Not Since Carrie, the musical theater of the 80s was dominated by such British pop operas as Evita, Phantom, and Les Mis. It's most unfortunate that the human comedy opened and closed on Broadway without anyone noticing that America had produced a work that could rival any of these. It is, in fact, the great American pop opera. And one moment in the human comedy found uh, the middle son, Homer Macaulay, the fastest telegraph messenger in town delivering a tragic cable to a war mother played in her Broadway de debut by In the Heights of original Abuela Claudia, Olga Meredith. Um, and this song was a juxtaposition, typical of the human comedy, of the aria of grief, the war mother, and the honky-tonk giddiness of two jitterbugging Bobby Soxers comparing notes on their first innocent, amorous adventures. And side note, both of these girl roles that you're about to see in our next song were understudied by Donna Murphy. Kevin's cousin. Um, <laughs> here, I know, here to sing from the human comedy are Sam Tadaldi, Elise Allen Lewis, Joel Ingram, and Allison Renee Foster.
Thank you.